Well, good morning. I'm not going to wait till 11:11 or 12:12 or or 1:11. I'm just not going to wait till 2:22 or 3:33 or 4:44. It's 9:44 and it's not a usual time, but it's when I'm starting today because it's been on my mind actually not just all morning, but for the past while this subject's been uh, working on me. <laughs> and so I'm going to talk about it. The challenge of moving into the new paradigm. Over the years, and especially since I began doing these videos, I have been challenged by people still stuck in the old paradigm of separation consciousness. I still struggle with it myself from time to time, since it is such a powerful program. To me, it will take some kind of malicious software removal program to get us onto a different track of perception, namely, the new paradigm reality of the interconnectedness of all life. This scientific and spiritual reality seems to challenge everything we've ever been told is true, especially in our religions. I was recently asked, or I says I I was asked recently, it's the same thing, but not the way I had it written down. Quote: If you are not separate from God, then who are you praying to, Ron? End quote. This simple question is actually profound, signifying the challenge many have with the paradigm of unity consciousness. I don't know all the answers yet. I'm working on finding them. But let me share some of what I see here. Hopefully it will help some of those facing this dilemma. Yes, this was a question that I struggled with when I began to see the bigger picture. When I began to get beyond my Christian fundamentalist evangelical upbringing, that Jesus was the only way, and the Bible was the, the Word of God, not just the Word of God, but the infallible Word of God, and that if it didn't measure up to the Bible, we weren't supposed to trust it. It was a challenge. I had a mentor, Dr. Bruce Morgan, who was, at one point in his life, the president of the Bible Institute of New England, and also the Vice President of the Fundamentalist Churches of America. He was a fundamentalist of fundamentalists till the Holy Spirit got a hold of him and began showing him some truths that were in the Bible that most Christians simply glossed over. Like, like God creates light and darkness, good and evil, that they are the same unto him that Moses drew near to the sick darkness or the thick darkness where God was, but in him is light and no darkness at all, which is true. Either either he's in the thick darkness or there's he's only light. Well the truth is both and. And that was the that was the big shift that I had to make in my own understanding, in my own consciousness in order to make peace within myself, because I had been trained, well-trained, as so many people in religion have been well-trained, in the either-or uh, mentality. You are either with us or against us, George Bush said. Yeah, well, what happens if it's both and? Which is more of a Hindu concept than it is a Christian or Muslim or Jewish concept. We've got to get to the both and, as Peter Van Runt and Aristo and I and many others have been trying to point out to people. God is both light and darkness, because God is all and in all. God is all that is. There's nothing made that he didn't make. When I say he, I'm using a, pro, a, gen, a male or a masculine pronoun, because that's what we're accustomed to. But God is neither only masculine or only feminine. God is both and. Always both and. Both and is the reconciliation 
of all things. It is the new paradigm of unity consciousness. It is the paradigm or the understanding that allows for the dance and ends the duel. D-U-E-L. That is the duality that we are moving beyond. That we are moving out of duality consciousness. Not duality. Duality is a gift to have masculine and feminine, light and dark. Without the duality, we wouldn't be able to experience life as we do. It would, I, I can't even imagine, for the life of me, I can't even imagine a, a, a world or an existence of any kind without duality, without contrast. I can't imagine it. Creation is contrast, or it's nothing at all. And yet, for people that have been reared in this, you're either with us or against us. You're either, you're either a believer or a non-believer. And in order to be a believer, you have to accept certain principles, certain dogmas, certain doctrines. And getting out of that mindset when we've been told that, you know, not to even trust our own heart. That out of the heart, the heart is exceedingly wicked. And out of it comes all the murders and and jealousies and envies and everything. They, they say that comes from the heart. No, it doesn't come from the heart. It comes from the ego. But the ego, to protect itself, diverts the attention to the heart and makes us think that it's our heart that's desperately wicked. And we wonder why we don't know who we are, why we are alienated within our own being, and why we can't create healthy relationships with each other, and why we can't have a world that's at peace instead of at war. Why? Because of separation consciousness. Because the ego is insane when it thinks that it can survive without the self, without the higher realities. That, it, it, that its physical, mental construct is sufficient, but it's insufficient to create true fulfillment and lasting peace. It's insufficient to do that job. It needs the higher self. But the higher self also needs the ego and the mental and the physical in which to experience itself because neither alone can do the job. It's both and. Now, what is the thing about praying to God? Okay, there's two, there's two basic Con, no, there's probably a whole lot more, but I'm going to talk about two basic concepts of God. Transcendence and immanence. The transcendent God is the God beyond creation. That God is very impersonal. That God is an observer, does not get involved. It merely looks on. Merely looks on at creation. It's that, that part or that aspect of God is not something we can relate to. It's beyond that that God is beyond our knowing because we are personal. And that God is impersonal. But there is another aspect of God, and that is the imminent aspect. God is within each part of creation, within each soul, within each expression of life. God is within all of those things. That's the eminence of the transcendent God. That's the God that is love, that can be known, that is touched with the feeling of our infirmity, that knows us better than we know ourselves because we forgot, because our ego tricked us into thinking that we were separate. But it was a trick. It was a trick all along. Call it Lucifer if you want. But Lucifer didn't do it. We did it to ourselves didn't we? There's only us here, isn't there? What if it's only us? The buskers sing a song. God didn't do it. God didn't do it. What if it's just you and me? What if we are the personalized, individualized expression of what we call God? That I believe is the truth. We are the personalized and individualized expressions of the divine, of the creator, expressing itself in creation, through us, as us. So when I pray to God, I'm not praying to some figure in the clouds with a long beard and white hair. 
I'm not talking to some archetypal entity that exists beyond me. I'm actually praying to that part of creator that exists within me. I'm looking to that part that is wisdom, that is truth, that is love, that is joy, that is merciful and patient and kind. That's the God that I pray to. The God who has made promises that can actually be manifested. But we don't believe that they can be manifested because we've been stuck in our separation consciousness. So people that are struggling to find God in a book, like the Bible, or the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita, or the Vedas, or any other uh, sacred writings, the Tao Te Ching, whatever, if we are struggling to find God in words, we are missing the whole thing. Because even in the book, and now I'm talking the Bible, because that's the one I know the best, but I'll bet you it's in the Quran. I'll bet you it's in the Bhagavad Gita. I bet you it's in the Vedas. I bet you it's in the Tao Te Ching, expressed in its own way. But in the Bible, it's expressed that the letter kills. You search the scriptures, Jesus said to the Pharisees, to the fundamentalists in his day, because in them you think you have eternal life, but you won't come to me that you might have life. What is spirituality? It's not a bunch of doctrines and dogmas. That's religion. And religion will always bind you and imprison you. It will always do that because that's what it's designed to do. It's designed to manipulate you through guilt and fear. And it does a very good job of it. But spirituality is, is a, a reality that is free. I wanted to say spirituality sets us free, but we already are free. We just have to get beyond the thinking that we're not. The limitation consciousness that somehow God is separate and we are bad. No, we're not. We're explorers. We're soul explorers, exploring all of the possibilities of what we can create and what we can experience. And each one of us is experiencing whatever we experience for the divine. Now, if we don't recognize that we're doing that, it's not going to do anything for us, is it? But when we come to recognize it, then we recognize, hey, this God, this imminent God, always has loved me. And the things that I've been taught, it's been misleading at the best. It's been partial truths at the best, but not the truth. The truth is always based on relationship, which is what mystics do. Whether they're Sufis, whether they're people that study the Kabbalah in, in, in Judaism or in Christianity. These are the people that really have a relationship with the divine. Their whole life is spent to know the divine and to, and to, and to dance with the divine as human beings. To have their human experience in a way that it brings heaven to earth in me. That's what spirituality is. That's what liberates us. That's the truth that liberates us. If you're trying to find the answers and search the scriptures, Jesus said, you're missing it. That's not where it is. The scriptures are, are useful. Your channel. They point, Sound they, muted. they point to different things that are significant, but they are not the destination. It's like the road map. But when you mistake the road map for the, for the vacation, it's not going to be as much fun, is it? I mean, how much fun can you have looking, looking at a, a, a map of a place and looking at all the pictures of how wonderful it is? All you're having is a superficial experience, something that is not real something that is not tangible. You've actually got to go there and be there and, and experience it for yourself. The same is true with God. You can study the scriptures till you're blue in the face. You can know them inside and out and upside down and backwards. You can, you can be 
totally, totally an intellectual <laughs> and, and really get a grasp, an intellectual grasp, so that you can even articulate what they mean to you. But it's still dead religion. It's still dead religion until you make it personal, until you learn that God is you, that the Holy Spirit, the Great Spirit, the Creator is you, as you. You are that. You're not all of that, but you are part of that, and you contain all of it, though you haven't yet experienced all of it. I hope what I'm saying makes just a teeny-witty bit of sense for you because I know so many struggle with this. They're trying to, to make unity consciousness fit into a mold that it was never designed to fit into. Unity consciousness liberates us to be ourself, to be authentic and genuine and real and to tell the truth and not to have to wear masks all the time and cover ourselves up with some kind of a, an acceptable persona. No. Spirituality is about being authentic and real, not about being nice and good all the time. Not about that. It's about being angry sometimes. It's about expressing emotions that we actually feel and preferably doing it in a healthy way that doesn't hurt anybody. Because when we wound, when we wound others, especially when we do it with intent to hurt, or to cause harm or loss, we are violating a cosmic law, a universal law that says do no harm. Do what thou wilt, but harm no one. This is something that we have to get our hearts around, even more so than our minds. I'm not saying to leave the mind out, however. We do have to also get our mind around it, but we have to get it and feel it in the heart and know that we are children of God, and we have to know that we've always have been, and it has nothing to do with our religion. It has nothing to do with our behavior. It has nothing to do with our sexual preferences. It has nothing to do with anything except the fact that in the beginning, all that was made was made from all that was, and all that was was the creator of all that is. I know that seems like a circle, but it's the truth. It is a circle. It is a spiral. It is life. It is the circle of life, the web of life. It is the interconnectedness of all life. And that's where we're going to find the answers. That's where we're going to find love. That's where we're going to escape the prison of our religion and get out of the letter that kills and into the spirit that gives life. Even the, even the scriptures point in that direction. They tell us where it is. It's not out there somewhere. The kingdom of heaven is in you and me and in all of us. And now we're living in a day and at a time when we're going to bring that kingdom of heaven into manifestation as we face honestly the challenge of moving into the new paradigm and become willing to let go of the either or thinking of separation consciousness and embrace fully the both and consciousness of unity that we are indeed one. And it's not a cult. It's not a re another religion. It's not some new age uh, theology. It is the reality that life is interconnected and we are all part of it. And when we see that, we can heal and become whole and we can do what all of the religions have told us we must do, namely to love one another. Thank you for listening. Namaste.